Thank you so much for joining this interview today, Alex. This is just an introduction to a longer one, which we'll be hopefully having in the very near future, talking about culture and other aspects evol revolving this important concepts. So in your opinion, what is culture? Okay, yeah, thanks for having me, Fahim. Uh, culture is one of my favorite things to study and really live and practice with. So there's two ways I would define culture. One is the mundane, simple, and dead definition of culture. So the kind of foods in a place, the language they speak, um, the kind of art, just the list of stuff that a certain people does. I would call that like the dead definition of culture. And then there's like the living culture, which is alive and organic, just like us as individuals. So sometimes it can change rapidly. Other times it can go into a more dogmatic turn and, and, and stay the same way for a long time. So uh, I should probably give you an example, right? Um, oh, and here's the point. With the dead culture, the dead aspect of culture, you can read about that in books, you can study it, you can watch movies about it, and you can learn everything you need to know, but it's typically not very useful or life-changing in any way. Whereas the live culture, you need to actually go talk to people from this culture and, and figure it out yourself. So I've got an excellent story for you about this. Um, I was in Vietnam as an English teacher, and uh, there was a new uh, professor from America who came to our city, Hanoi. And uh, me and a friend of mine, also American, we invited him to our favorite uh, restaurant to, you know, meet him and just welcome him to, uh, to the town, I guess. And uh, so we're sitting around and, he, you know, he's talking about his PhDs and uh, he was one of the first Americans to be to allow to enter Vietnam after the war. And he studied Vietnamese for so long and, and stuff. And uh, and he just starts yelling something in Vietnamese. I didn't know what it was, but he just says, oh, yeah, no, oh, no, no. and I'm looking at my other friend I'm like, what's going on? And none of the waiters, no one else there is responding. So I said, uh, hey, man, what are you trying to do? And he said, oh, well, this is, you know, how you call the waiter or the waitress in Vietnamese, of course. I said, no, that's not how you do it. This is how you do it. Am I? And then, and then she comes running a second later. How can I help you? And uh, then we make our order. So it's a classic example of like you read it in a book. It's supposed to work but then you actually come to the real world and sometimes it's different. There's dialects that are different, uh, different. Uh, there's so many different variables because like I said, it's alive and it's organic. That's real living culture, which I like to really play around with. Yeah. The, you mentioned, you mentioned a very good point. Um, and I think if correct me, if I'm wrong, you put, you put language in, um, dead aspect as a dead aspect of culture yeah so and okay because because i'm doing languages and that's a very very interesting point we might not over time you know and i i, I, I don't think if we can put language in um as a dead category you know so fahim i i'm sorry i i I missed like half of what you said, but oh. I, I would caveat. I would just, just say there's a dead aspect and a living aspect to language. It's both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how would you, how would you differentiate? Well, it's very simple. The living aspect of language is what people are actually using and saying on the ground. And then the mm -hmm. dead aspect could sometimes be the same thing, or it could be, you know, something that's written in a book, which people can understand very well, but they don't actually use it in conversation or 
or in other places. For example, language of Shakespeare um, can be a dead aspect of language and, you know, recent made of vocabulary in dictionaries, for example, can be a living aspect. Is that what you're trying to say? I think so. Yeah, I think it's a good example. Like Shakespeare mm. is very dead. It's, mm. it's, it's clear that he was a great writer and there's much to be gained from studying Shakespeare. But because that kind of English is so different from the one that's alive today in New Zealand, America, everywhere else, you have to be like a scholar. You have to be really smart and studious to actually just understand anything of Shakespeare, I think. Um, yeah. So t to really get Shakespeare, it's not just the language. You also need to study the uh, historical context and the, and the other aspects of culture from which Shakespeare came about. And then you can really start to understand Shakespeare. And uh, one, one good example of like a, a living language in English, English is changing very fast, but you know, there's so many words that are in use today that weren't even in use five years ago, like lit, yo, I'm so lit, or, I mean, God, there's so many other ones. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of call it like teenager language or internet slang or whatever, but it's very alive, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main difference. That's right. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And so moving from USA to different, to various Asian countries, how were you able to adapt yourself with, with different cultures? Whether they language or whether they behavior, or the lifestyle, and so on. How, how were you able to, you know, get adapted? Mm, great question. So in the beginning, it was pure necessity. So I, w I found myself in Thailand, in rural Thailand, a very small town. It's called Tatum, but even if I tell you how to spell it, you may not even find it on Google Maps. Very tiny town. Uh, I was the only foreigner in this town, one of the only people who could speak English in any sort of capacity, and uh, I was stuck there. I didn't have that much money in my bank account. I just had this one job, and I knew I had to just make it work at least until I got my first paycheck and just go from there. So, you know, you go to the market, you got to buy some food, otherwise you starve. <laughs> so I had to figure it out, you know, and uh, it's, it's really sloppy at first and it's very humbling for me. I really miss being in that humble position. Now I've been living abroad for so long, I'm actually really comfortable and uh, I just fit in really well in most Asian cultures. But, you know, at first I would, I would go to the market, I'd, I'd find some tomatoes, let's say, and I'd point at the tomatoes and I'd say, one, two, three, four, four, four tomatoes, please, <laughs> you know? And uh, they, they go, huh, huh? And, and then it's like, okay, how much money? And I, and I, at first, you know, you just take out your money and then they just like, you know, take it from you, whatever it is, you know, not, not in a rude way, but they're trying to get the, the transaction done. So they okay. Okay. It's this much. Okay. Okay. Uh, cop, 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 you know, so you, yeah. there's basic, you learn, thank you. You learn numbers one to 10 and from, you know, the most basic level, you can start to buy things. And then from there, it just builds. Yeah, that's right. You mentioned about, necessity you said it's it's it was necessary for you to to adapt yourself mm -hmm. and you basically started with the language but is it really necessary to get adapted to the culture of the country you're living in oh good question uh no it's not necessary if you are not a decent person but if you're decent yeah it's base it depends right if you're going from new zealand to canada you don't need to do anything. It's basically mm -hmm. the same culture. Canadians like maple syrup. New Zealanders like, I don't know, kiwi fruit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very, <laughs> very minor difference, which you don't even need to think about, right? But going yeah. from where I was from, New England, 
New England area in America to rural Thailand, if, if I take my cultural, um, uh, what's the word, attitude and uh, mm. just very simple things like how you nod your head when you talk to people, the, how you move your hands, a lot of those things, if you just do it as you normally do in a totally different culture, people can get insulted, offended, disrespected. So if you don't want that to happen, then yeah, you want to be very humble and very eyes open, ears open, and, and pay attention to how others are doing things. And at the beginning, you're a parent. You just copy what they do. And, uh, one, and then eventually you get a hang of it. And then once you get a hang of it, now you have two cultures. You have two different operating systems. You have your, your own one that you've been used to for many years and this new one. And you can, then you can start to play around with both. And that's where it gets really exciting. Yeah. And what, what causes you to, you know, switch from one culture into another? So these days, um, at least, so now I'm in China and I'm just very comfortable in China um, with Chinese culture. Um, and because I'm so comfortable and, and I fit in so well here, I typically just do my own thing. I don't do a, an American culture type stuff or Chinese culture stuff. I've kind of combined both of them and I just kind of behave naturally. So and you have the third culture. So kind of combination of them. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is the more you start combining all these cultures, the more you become a culture of one. <laughs> you become more and more okay. alone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, but it, it's not a, you know, I'm not actually alone. Uh, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to so many other different people from so many different countries and, and, and whatnot. So you develop as a person, you know, and you, it, in a way it always is getting easier. Um, but as, as far as like, uh, it's up to you what you want to do. So for me, I'm at kind of the ceiling of, of what life for me can be like in China. And so I'm leaving um, because and I guess here's why is because if I wanted to be very Chinese, let's say, I'm, I'm almost there. Like there's only a few things that I have, a few fundamental things about Chinese culture that I haven't learned and mm. I don't need to learn them. The stuff, the really life changing stuff about China, Chinese culture, I've already learned them and integrated actually a lot of them into my character. Um, so the only reason I would stay here is if I just want to stay here, if I have a good job or a good, good friends or a girlfriend or anything like that. Then I then I could stay, but I don't really have those things, so I'm leaving. I have a great job. Yeah. But. So basically, um, when you were in China, Vietnam, or even Thailand, you went through the the process of cultural adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went through a two two years of really intense adaptation and immersion. Immersion is a better way of saying it. And then once I once I was able to 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 do that well, to live comfortably and effectively in Thailand, Vietnam, and China, then I went back to America and I stayed there for a little while. And that was crazy because I'd never, I'd never lived in America as, as a person who wasn't only American, if that makes sense. I, I, it was like I was, I was there as a tourist because effectively I was. I wasn't living there. I was just staying there for a few months and then I was going back to Asia. So I saw, then I saw America in a, in a very different light. And um, I was also gaining more money. My savings was increasing. So... The, so this is where I am now, where I'm, I don't have a motivation to go out and meet Chinese people and do all these different things because I'm just very comfortable. I just don't have a motivation to do that. 
there's other reasons too. I'm a vegetarian and they're definitely not. That complicates things. <laughs> <laughs> um, regarding um, immersion and adaptation, do you differentiate between these two terms and how they actually work out? Yeah, I think it's an important distinction. So going back to the first time I was as an expat living in rural Thailand, I was fully immersed. So the idea of adapting, it, it didn't even enter my mind because I was mostly acting out of necessity. How to put food in my belly, how to commingle with my coworkers and peacefully, you know, knowing that I don't know anything about this culture. Um, and uh, th so that's immersion. And, and yes, you, within that process of immersion, you will naturally adapt so much. But to me, immersion means you're actually giving up your, your own life, your own culture, whatever it is. You're, for, you're f putting that way to the background and, and, and focusing totally on what's in front of you and what's happening now. That's immersion. And then adapting to a different culture is kind of like a 50-50 split, or it's more like where you, you kind of maintain your identity, your cultural identity, and you, you start to slowly pick little pieces from here and there uh, from the other culture. So if you, you know, if you're really vulnerable or um, scared or something, then, then the adaptability um, approach would be much better. Now, if you're like me at the beginning, you're very brave, very adventurous, and you're, you're ready to just jump in to some land you don't know anything about and just bring it on everything, then immersion is the best way. And you learn so much in such a short amount of time. Um, I'm, I'm really like, I'm, I'm kind of envious of my former self, you know, because I haven't been able to really do that again in, in some years. And um, I think back on, on those, those years with so much like uh, glory and it's just so cool, but now I'm just so comfortable, you know? <laughs> that's, that's very interesting because it's not easy for, you know, many people to, you know, immerse themselves in the culture and adapt themselves with the culture that they are living in. So it's a little bit challenging for them, but I think, we can we can probably have another session together and talk about how this journey of cultural immersion um, was reflected in your intercultural communication um, with with the the people that you were you were living in the people around you so that would be a very interesting topic to discuss probably in the next um, session I think we're running out of time for this one but um, I would like to ask you and invite you one more time to join me in another session and discuss this intercultural communication and cultural immersion that you experienced as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fahim. It's really great talking to you. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for the second, our second chat. Sure. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day and have a lovely evening. I don't know what time it is, but <laughs> have a lovely time. <laughs> yes, you too. Have a lovely time. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.